Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to St. Luke's, where spirits come alive. It is a joy to welcome you to worship in this uh, Easter season. We say a warm welcome to all of our guests and to those who are joining us from home on streaming. I invite you to take out your connection card and fill it out. Guests, please leave a cell phone or email so I can get in touch with you and get to know your story better. Those joining us from home can contact me through the website or write to me on Messenger. I love to take our guests out to coffee, and that's true for you at home as well, or we can meet on Zoom. Um, We're going to serve Holy Communion this morning. I'll give instructions closer to that time in the service for those worshiping in person. Those joining us from home, we invite you to get a piece of bread or a cracker and some juice or wine to join us in the sacrament as well. We will have a few more announcements at the end of the service. Um, I know you can tell I'm a little congested and have seen me wearing a mask already this morning. I just have a head cold. I've had two negative tests for COVID. So um, I will use lots of hand sanitizer and wear a mask to serve communion. So um, it's nothing more than that. So no worries. Uh, We begin our service in the Easter season with a thanksgiving for baptism instead of a confession. Please rise in body or spirit. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and you planted us in a well-watered garden. You brought liberation through the waters of the Red Sea and in the desert you gave us water from a rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the Good Shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross you watered us from Jesus' wounded side. And on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font and for all water everywhere. Wash us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life anew that only you can give. 
Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Please turn and face the processional cross for our gathering song, This Joyful Easter Tide. The love of God poured into our hearts, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and the abundant life of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray together. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do, so others may know new life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We invite the children, youth, and everyone else who's young at heart to join Pastor Janet and me on the steps for the children's message. All right. Here we go. Hi, Sayel. Good morning, Ellie. What a beautiful dress you have with hearts on aspect. Ellie's wearing a beautiful dress with hearts. And here comes um, Bryn's cousin. I don't know his name. Coda. And here comes Bryn. Coda. Okay. Well, it's ha I'm happy to see all of you today. You look wonderful on this joyful Easter tide. We're still in Easter, aren't we? Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Here's to test your memory. Ready? On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus had supper with his best friends, the disciples, right? And one of the things he said to them was, I give you a new commandment. Because they had the Ten Commandments already, right? And what was his new commandment? That you... Trust. No? <laughs> it's supposed to be a heart, sorry. Johnny? Love. Love. Heart. <laughs> love one another, that you love one another. Say it with me. Love, love one, one another. another. Okay? So one of the things we know about love is, read this for me. Love is kind. Right? Love is kind. It says it in the Bible, Levi. Love is kind. So we do kind things for one another, don't we? Now, some of the folks who love this church very much can't come here on Sunday mornings. They're sick or have to, for some other reason they have to stay home. And sometimes they watch it on, t on the streaming. So let's wave to them. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, all those of you who are homebound. And another thing we do is we take Holy Communion to them. Since they can't come here to be with us, at the altar, we take it to them. So I would like all of the people involved in taking Holy Communion to the homebound to stand up. Would you all stand up where you are? Look at these wonderful folks who do that. And there are others who aren't here, but they do it also. Okay. So they have to have they have to have the the Holy Communion to take, don't they? And we're going to use ones that are on the altar. So in order to do that, I'm going to put these up there on the altar. And Pastor Linda's going to help me. So we get them in just the right place so they can be blessed. And we'll say, the children have helped to bless these kits of Holy Communion to take to those who can't be here, who are the homebound, as an act of kindness in love. Because what's our commandment to do? Love, love one, one another. another. And what else? Love heart. That's right. Use your heart to love one another. Excellent. Okay, now you get to go to Luke's Learners. <laughs> all right. We're all going to run out of church like that because we're so excited to serve Jesus in the world. Thank you, Pastor Janet and children. <laughs> we continue with the reading of God's holy word. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Your boasting is not a good thing. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you, are, as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these last days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and elders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to him, oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Christ. Last week I mentioned briefly that when I was a freshman in college, it was the campus pastor who told me that I should think about becoming a Lutheran pastor. And uh, he was leaning against the doorframe of his office in the campus ministry house, and when I grasped what he was saying to me, I saw a light above his head, and I had this knowing feeling in my chest. And I thought to myself, that is exactly what I am supposed to do with my life. It was a moment of revelation. My parents had never seen a woman pastor before, and they were not so sure about this idea. And our most recent church that we had um, had our membership app because we moved a lot was a Missouri Synod congregation. Well, my parents knew me better than anybody. So I began to think that maybe this conviction of the heart that I felt about becoming a pastor was really just heartburn. (laughs) Take two Tums, walk away, find another career. My parents, my freshman year, I said this last week too, um, lived in Brussels. So I spent a year living in Brussels after my freshman year of college where my dad was working. And then after that, I transferred from my sophomore year of college to a Lutheran college in northern Minnesota. Because I had walked away from being convinced of my call 
to be a pastor, I double majored in psychology and political science and history, creating two pathways out of the church. I could become a psychologist and I could go to law school. I was really working this walk away thing. Um, But I was really looking forward to chapel at a Lutheran college because I thought this is really gonna be good. And so one of the first services that I went to, the campus pastor read a children's book called Freddy, the Falling Leaf. I was dumbfounded. Instead of speaking to the real life issues that we are struggling with as college students about becoming adults, developing identity, vocational discernment, I could go on. We were given saccharine stories and superficial platitudes. When I needed something to encourage me with my parents living halfway across the world, something to help me discern what I was supposed to do with my life, the church was not pulling me in, it was helping me walk away with sappy crap. I don't like sappy spirituality now. I certainly didn't like it then either. I wanted to take that stupid book and hit the campus pastor in the head with it it, when I walked out of chapel. I was like, take me at 20 years old. Okay, it it wasn't pretty. Be glad you didn't know me then. So perhaps you too have had a time when you've walked away from God, when you've walked away from faith, from Jesus, or from the church, from part of it or from the whole thing. Sometimes we do not receive support from others when we most want it. Sometimes we need support from the church or from a faith community, and it is not forthcoming. Or worse, people in the church hurt us, and we wonder, where is God in the mess of this? Nothing makes sense. We are disappointed. We are in pain. We're mad. We want to hit people with a children's book. Not good. And and the only option that we can see is to walk away, to take a break, to find a new path. But it's especially hard when the church or a ministry or a congregation disappoints us because we merge that experience with God. And it feels like God has forgotten about us or God has hurt us. And that, to me, is the worst spiritual feeling that there is. Our gospel reading today tells the story of two disciples, Cleopas and another disciple whose name we're not given. And they also walk away. And they do it on the very first Easter morning, no less. Apparently, they did not believe the testimony of the women who came from the empty tomb in their excitement over seeing a vision of angels telling them that Jesus had risen from the dead. Other disciples also went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had told them. So it was clearly possible that the story was true. Wouldn't you want to stay in Jerusalem and find out if the story was real, discover the facts? But no, these two disciples are in pain. They're stuck in their story of grief and feeling forgotten. Jesus had died. He was not the Messiah. God had forgotten all about them. And all they could think about was how Jesus' mission had failed them. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, but it didn't work. He died. He was crucified. In their disappointment and in their grief, they walked away from the empty tomb. They walked away from the testimony of resurrection. And they walk away from their community, which is trying, trying to believe that maybe something new just might be happening. When we walk away, we expect God to walk away from us because we imagine that God's patience and love and forbearance is akin to ours, which is not a lot, right? That's where the book whacking comes in. 
God's patience must be about as long as mine. So if I'm walking away, God must be too. But that's not what the risen Jesus does, does it? Is it? While Cleopas and his companion are headed to Emmaus, away from the empty tomb, away from resurrection, away from the church, away from relationship with Jesus and their whole community, the risen Jesus follows them. The risen Jesus finds them on the road, and the risen Jesus joins them on their journey out of Jerusalem. Honestly, whose God does this? Jesus says, if you're going to run away, I'm going to run away with you. What an awesome God. And so he does. Jesus is like, okay, I'm running with you then. And so Jesus engages them in conversation. And he listens to their broken hearts. And he teaches them and illuminates their own faith to them while they're doing what? Still walking away. Still running away. And he just loves them and goes with them and runs away with them. That is just an awesome image, isn't it? I mean, it's just glorious. So Jesus becomes their incognito companion on their journey, showing up in friendship and conversation and in this gentle love. And there are no shoulds and no shaming and what were you thinking? Just a companion walking beside them, so much so that the wayward disciples invite Jesus to join them for a meal and lodging for the night. Whenever we walk away from faith, from worship, from Jesus, from prayer, from a relationship with him, whether it's for a day, a week, a year, a decade, or more, the risen Jesus always follows us and finds us. He runs away with us, and he discovers where we are on that road, wherever we are going. Jesus runs away with us. God's patience, love, and forbearance is not limited like ours. It is limitless and eternal. And that is why God sent Jesus to show us what eternal love looks like. Patience that is more forbearing than our stubborn spirits. Love that is more powerful than death itself. The risen Jesus always searches for the wayward. The risen Jesus always looks for the hurting and the grieving. The risen Jesus always chases after those who are too hurt to stay. Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. You know, the Lord's presence comes in so many forms. A person who supports us, an experience that helps us change direction, a new opportunity that we had not anticipated, a fresh insight or way of thinking, an experience in nature, a new Bible study, even a bodily experience, like a conviction of the heart, a gut feeling, goosebumps, or that sense of the Spirit's energy moving through us. I wonder, how has Jesus found you when you have turned away, whether it was for a day, a week, a year, or longer? This week, I invite you into two spiritual practices. The first one is simply to pay attention Pay attention to how Jesus finds you during this week, both internally and externally. 
First, pay attention internally and trust your body's signals. You know, we're made in the image of God with bodily signals, and we're not really taught to pay attention to God showing up. This is why Jesus became incarnate. We, uh, God shows up for us in those aha moments, in that conviction in the chest, in the gut feeling, in the flesh of the spirit, in goosebumps, or in the words of the Emmaus Road disciples and their heart burning. Our temptation is to write it off as weird or nothing, or in my case, indigestion. I'm always like, is this the Holy Spirit or do I need a Tums? <laughs> but this is how God works through the body. The spirit of Jesus needs earthly matter to show up in. Do you get that? The spirit of the risen Jesus needs earthly matter to show up in. That is why we say we are the hands and the feet of the risen Christ in the world. So pay attention how Jesus shows up in your physical body, in insight, in sensations. Pay attention to the physical clues that Christ is here, dwelling inside you, giving you a nudge. And when you feel that nudge, that heart burning, that gut feeling, those goosebumps, look up, pay attention. Jesus is saying, look closely at what is happening around you and in you, because this is a God moment. And are you paying attention to it? Are you taking note that God is showing up for you in this moment and has something to show you? See it, notice it, learn from it, embrace it. God loves you. God is here for you. What is God showing you? And then pay attention externally at the people around you, the conversations that you have, the nature that you see, the music that you hear the love that you experience, the opportunities that come your way, the events that are unfolding before you, the moments that you experience. Where do you see good? Where do you see love? Where do you see God at work? All of these things are moments of the risen Jesus showing up on the road of your journey. We see, I think I said this last week too, Jesus wants us to get this apparently. We see what we are looking for. God wants us to be looking for God showing up for us. Okay, practice number two. This is harder. Practice forgiving the church and other Christians for failing you. This is harder than it sounds because we want Christians, we want the church, we want ministry institutions to be better, to be less sinful, to do fewer things wrong and more things right. So maybe start with one resentment that you are hanging on to. We forget that people are just people, full of their own issues and hurts. And we forget that their mistakes, their pain, their stupid chapel services, or lousy church behavior does not speak for God, does not always speak for God. We forget that every institution, no matter how holy it or we try to be, is still human and therefore equally prone to sin, to failure, to brokenness, just like, well, we are. Right? Right. The difference, the difference is not that we in the church do not sin, Not that Christians do not sin, but that we have a process in Matthew 18 for talking about it, for repenting, for having conversation, for asking for forgiveness, for offering forgiveness, and for living in reconciliation. I've had to practice this numerous times in the six years that I've been the pastor here. I've made many mistakes. I've had to talk to many of you and say, I'm sorry I didn't do what I said I would, I forgot. Or I didn't do what I should have done. Or I said something I shouldn't have said. I've had to apologize to many of you. I have received your forgiveness and we have reconciled. And the wonderful thing about practicing this is that's when it gets really great, doesn't it? because we have much more meaningful relationships, much more profound community, much deeper love, and that's when we actually have the power to change the world, because then we are truly practicing Christ-like love. 
Do you get that? Don't you experience that in your deepest relationships where you have experienced deep forgiveness and reconciliation? Don't you have a better relationship when that happens? Okay. Okay, all right, just checking, right? Right, anybody who is in a deep, intimate relationship knows that it's deeper when you have forgiveness and reconciliation, right? That is the mission of the church. We're doing that on a larger scale here. And when we do that here in this setting and with other Christians, now we have the power to change the world because we are embodying Christ-like love. And then people say, oh, here, they're doing it differently, right? The best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. So we're not perfect here, but we practice repentance and reconciliation with each other. We are all a work in progress. So, you know what? I rarely liked chapel in college. It it never got better. But a friend told me who the best preacher was in town at the local church, and Jesus found me there. I had great professors who mentored me, and Jesus found me there. I went on an urban semester in Chicago, and Jesus found me in the inmates I tutored in Cook County Jail, in the African-American Lutheran Church on the west side of Chicago where I volunteered, and in the people at the homeless shelter where I worked on weekends. And pretty soon, I discovered how much Jesus mattered to them and how much Jesus mattered to me. And one day, quite accidentally, I stopped saying, if I go to seminary, and said when I go to seminary. And the decision was out of my mouth before I had consciously chosen it. But the conviction of the heart came back because Jesus found me wherever I was. And my parents, well, they were both in tears the first time I served them communion at my internship congregation. And they bought the champagne for my ordination reception. (laughs) So the risen Jesus finds all of us on our journey wherever we are. And my parents uh, could never have been prouder that they have a female Lutheran pastor for a daughter. The two Emmaus Road disciples do not recognize Jesus until he breaks bread with them. And ultimately, the risen Jesus finds us in this meal where he calls us by name. He calls us by name. It's why I call you by name when I give you communion. And he says that forgiveness and the love that he brings to each of us, he does it personally to you as an important member of this great community of the body of Christ. And so as we receive Jesus' body and blood today, we accept his incognito companionship, amen? And we accept his constant presence. And we will experience this internally, and we will see him all around us as Jesus finds us over and over and over again, wherever we are. Let the church say amen.
please join me in our Easter creed. I believe in the God of Easter morning, who awakes us from our darkest dreams and leads us into the light of a new day, who meets our pessimism with stunning hope of angelic proclamation. I believe in the God of Easter day, who beats us to the obstacles in our lives and empties the dark tomb for us, who appears in surprising ways when we least expect it, walking with us on our detours. I believe in the God of Easter evening, who breaks into our closets and prisons, bringing peace and crushing fear. I believe in the risen Lord, who meets us with wounds on his hands and feet, who grants us his spirit, sending us out to bring shalom to the world. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You may kneel and body your spirit. You may remain seated if that is more comfortable. Ever-present Lord, help us to trust that Jesus finds us even when we walk away. Help us to see his presence even when we turn in the opposite direction. Make every meal, every new bloom of spring, every experience of love and goodness, however small, a potent reminder that your loving presence permeates our lives and the whole creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, where the church is persecuted in places like India, Pakistan, and China, protect it. Where the church is privileged, grant it humility and help us not to take it for granted. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Reveal your presence and end the oppression and difficulties that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through the day. Bless those who are sick and in need, especially Ross, Ivana, Carol, Kaylin, Maria, Bill, Ed and Carol, Jim and Linda, Ralph, Irene, Shella, Joy, Kara, Rita, Carol, and those we name in our hearts and aloud now. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith and for your spirit in our midst. Feed us at your Easter table with your presence and fill us with your wisdom that we may reveal your presence in the breaking of bread and in our food ministries, carrying out your mission in Richardson with energy and imagination. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death, especially Mary Knoshog and Kim Sherwood, Comfort the Chateau and Ewell families at the death of their loved ones, and comfort all who grieve. Renew our trust in your promises that we live with courage and compassion until we join the saints in eternal life. God of grace. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of the risen Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please turn and uh, face the balcony and wave a sign of peace to those who are joining us from home and serving in the balcony in audio and technology and photography. Then you can turn and uh, wave a sign of peace or greeting or handshake to those uh, worshiping near you. Uh, then you can be seated for the offering, and we are so grateful for all of the gifts toward the uh, mission of our congregation, which is independent and self-supporting. Uh, you can use the QR code in the bulletin. Those who are joining us from home can um, mail in your offering, or you can go to our website and click give.
Let us pray together. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day, you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, living, and loving God, we praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We give you thanks for Jesus, who, living among us, healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. Those worshiping at home may lift your elements with the words of institution. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink. 
saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the light of Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, gives everyone a place at the welcome table. Alleluia. We come to the feast. You may be seated. Everyone is welcome at the table, regardless of church history or denomination or background. Come up the center aisle to receive the bread. You can ask for gluten-free wafer, uh, gluten-free bread. Proceed to the communion server on the same side on which you're um, seated. You can have white grape juice or red wine. Return to your seat by the side aisle and throw away your cup in the trash. If you cannot come forward, you will be served in the pew at the end. Those communing at home can receive communion now. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please rise in body or spirit for the blessing. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, resurrection, you you send send light to to conquer conquer darkness darkness, and and the the bread bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your love to all the world through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Let us pray the blessing of our home communion. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, bless those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick and homebound. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to call forward Sam Sherrod and his whole family because we're going to say a blessing and a prayer upon him uh, because he has completed his Eagle Scout and his honor court is this afternoon in the Congregational Life Center at 3 o'clock. And while they come forward, I'm going to say two other announcements. Adult Ed resumes next week, and today we're going to meet with um, young adults and families in the Adult Ed room with the evangelism team for a feedback session and lunch. So if you are in that age group, uh, please join us for lunch in the Adult Ed room, and we're going to talk about future mission and have lunch. So, um, okay, those are my two announcements. All right, Sam, how about this? Eagle Scout of St. Luke's right here. So if you can come back at 3 o'clock and celebrate with the family, uh, it'll be in the Congregational Life Center. He renovated the youth room. So if you have not seen the redone youth room with nice laminate flooring and cupboard and refrigerator and all kinds of great stuff. And also, if you recall, Virginia and Natalie both did their silver awards here. We have a historical display in the gathering area that Virginia did and the outdoor food pantry that Natalie did. So we love the Sherrod family. So um, we're just so honored that you are such awesome, faithful, Christ-centered people. And right now we're going to say a blessing upon Sam as you celebrate your Eagle, um, Eagle Scout honors today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the shared family, for their faithfulness to you, for their walk with Christ, and for their service in this church and in the world. Today we lift up Sam and we give thanks for his service, for his hard work, for the beautiful youth room that he chose to do his Eagle Scout project to serve St. Luke's. We rejoice in his gifts. We pray for your blessing upon him today at the celebration. May his heart be full. We give thanks for his parents and their mentoring, for the whole family, for their, his sisters, and for everyone, for the love that is shared and for all of the service and faithfulness that we see here. We ask that you bless the celebration today, and we give thanks for all who helped Sam, for the youth group, for Jerry Zimmerman, and for the scouts, and for everyone who came together to support him. Continue to bless uh, Sam and his family with the guidance of your holy wisdom, and continue to help all of us to grow with him into the full stature of Christ. We pray in your holy name. Let the church say amen. Amen. Now please rise and body your spirit for the final blessing. And I'll say it for all of you too. The blessing of the living God, the creator, the risen Christ, and the Holy Spirit surround and sustain you, keep you from harm, and fill you with hope and courage. Amen.
filled with resurrection joy, go in peace to love, serve, and welcome all. Thanks be to God.